the book of Ecclesiastes. But before we get into our message, uh, Lord laid it on my heart. I haven't done this for a while, but I got to give you a COVID update. You say, well, Pastor, I thought we're over this. Well, we're almost over it. There are two emotions, again, as I've shared with you in our newsletter from time to time, that, that I think permeate this country and really this world in the matter of this pandemic, and that is anger and, and fear. A recent report showed the effects of these emotions. These are very powerful emotions, by the way. A recent survey has shown that one in 10 believers read their Bibles daily. One in 10 believers read their Bibles daily. What does that mean? That means their minds are preoccupied, their hearts are preoccupied with anger or fear. And then another survey showed that 6% of Americans had a biblical worldview, which means they view the world and all the things around them with the Bible in mind. There is a group coming out in this time during this pandemic, and they have called themselves progressive Christians. Their philosophy tells us that culture should determine how we are to interpret our Bibles. But beloved, the Bible is the supreme authority in all believers' lives. Culture does not change the Bible. The Bible changes culture. They've got it backwards, do they not? What are we seeing today? We're seeing a very interesting thing happen. And I blame it on the pandemic. I blame it on, on the situation that we've been going through with anger and fear. They did another statistical study showing that more churches are closing today than are opening. Think of that. First time in the history of America, more churches are closing rather than opening. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And what we are seeing is the plight of the last days Laodicean apostate church, beloved. We are seeing that. There are major Christians in groups who are in also positions as pastors who are coming out saying now they are no longer Christians. One, there's a new term out called ex-evangel. Not evangelical, but ex-evangel. There are Christians who are now saying they are no longer evangelical, that they are literally t uh, basically testing and, and uh, questioning the things of the Bible. What a tragedy. So we must bear witness that we are believers. We must bear witness in this time of dark tragedy that we'll be the light and the salt of the world. So, beloved, that's for your extra nickel that you put in the plate today. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Chapter 3 and verse 11. There are two types of thinking in the world. This kind of goes along with my COVID update. But anyway, there are two types of thinking in the world today. There is horizontal thinking and there is vertical thinking. The horizontal thinking is the thinking of the world, where the vertical thinking is the thinking of God. A Christian living in the here and now, we must maintain a balance of both worlds, the heavenly and the earthly. You've heard the old story that says, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. But then the opposite is true too. They're so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. So we need to have a balance, folks. We are definitely in the world, Jesus said. You are in the world, but you're not of the world. And so therefore, we must maintain a, a balance of these two thinkings. Reality demands an earthbound existence, but our spirit reveals by faith a future eternal reality. Beloved, this is not our world. This is not our world. We're only passing through. And so we see that we must believe in that future reality. Galatians 3.11 says, but that no one is justified by the law 
in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Oh, beloved, let us remember that we are living in a world that's full of darkness, a world that's full of sin. That's why our hearts should not be troubled. That's why when we see these things and read these things and watch these things on TV or on the internet, beloved, let not Jesus said your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And so we see we need to have that balanced thinking to live only for this world and its sinful existence produces for many a cynical and pessimistic perspective of life. And this is exactly what's happened to Solomon in his latter days. Sometimes, folks, we are overcome by the things of this world. We overcome by the things that everybody's shouting and screaming and running in the streets like idiots. But, oh, beloved, let me tell you, the king is coming. Let me say to you, keep your eyes on heaven. Keep your eyes on the world yet to come. For the believer that lives by faith gives us insight, enables us to live the life not just under the sun, but under heaven. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Folks, we may not know what God is doing today in our lives. We may not have a full understanding of everything that's going on, but, oh, beloved, we can trust him. We can trust the Lord. Therefore, keep your eyes on that which is not seen. But on what is unseen, for what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. Oh, beloved, let's not keep our eyes on this scene. Let's keep our eyes on the scene yet to come. We're going to see two things. We're going to see in Solomon's pessimistic perception. We're going to see Solomon's look at life, and we're going to see Solomon's look at life hereafter. So let's take a look here, starting with verse 12 through 17. We're going to see Solomon looks at life. And he's going to look very carefully at life in the garden, and he's going to look at life on this earth. Look at verse 12 through 15. We see life's significant purpose. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. This is a gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which it has already been and what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. Moreover, I saw under the sun in a place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. We see Solomon's look at life. We see his significant purpose. Life as described in the garden as we see in verse 12 and 13. What we must understand is Solomon in verse 12 and 13 is describing a world that does not exist in this life. He's describing a world that does not exist in his life. In verse 12, we see a time of righteous good works. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 24, the Bible says, Nothing is better for a man that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. What is he speaking of? He's speaking of the life that Adam had and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. We see a time of righteous good works. That's why God put man on this planet. God gave him a righteous good work, gave him a garden to tend, gave him life to live, gave him food to eat, 
gave him animals from companionship until he gave him a wife. We see that God made man perfect and joy in the work of his world in sinless perfection. Adam enjoyed life. Solomon is clicking on that thought that there is a perfect life, a perfect world that had been. It's going to be again, beloved. One day you and I are going to be with God. One day you and I are going to be in the new heaven and the new earth. And it'll be just like that time. Life will not be laborious. You won't wake up on a Monday morning and say, oh, I got to go to work again. What am I going to do? You won't have to take an aspirin. You won't have to take an ibuprofen. You'll never have to go to a pharmacist or a doctor again. Imagine, huh? A perfect life. A time of righteous good works. In verse 13, he shows a time of rejoicing in God's wonder. Imagine what kind of a life Adam had there in the garden. To see firsthand the glories and the wonders of God. To see animals that were perfect. Imagine walking by a tiger. The other night I was dreaming and I had a dream about Jim Isaacs. Every time I dream about anybody, I always pray for him. So he had a day that the pastor was praying for him. Because lo and behold, I was there in the open door. I was coming out and there was Jim walking through the backyard. And he was heading towards another area and suddenly a bear came on him. <laughs> And started chasing after him, and Jim began running. I said, come this way, Jim. And Jim was zigzagging and coming. And then I woke up. <laughs> so, Jim, I don't know if you made it or not. Don't go anywhere with a lot of bears, buddy. <laughs> but, you know, Adam was never chased by a bear. He was never chased by a lion or a tiger. He had them come up to him. He petted them, took care of them, named them, fed them, did all those good things. It was a time of rejoicing in God's wonder. God's wonder was a perfect world, a perfect work, and a perfect walk with God. Imagine. I can't begin to imagine. One day, beloved, we're going to have that again. Those of us who love Christ and live for Christ, we're going to rule and reign with him. In verse 14 and 15, we see a life as determined by God. Look in verse 14, we see the omnipotence of God, the eternal sovereignty of God in verse 14. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it, the men should fear before him. God doesn't ask for my permission, <laughs> nor does he ask for yours. <laughs> God doesn't ask for our ideas. He doesn't ask, what do you think about this? You think I should do this? God doesn't ask us. Folks, he's sovereign. He does. Now, he might share some things with us to get us to understand. But in reality, God is in control. There's not a thing happening in this world that God does not know about. There's not a person in this world that God doesn't know. Oh, beloved, there are things said in secret. There are things done in the back room, the smoke-filled rooms with all the, the window blinds all pulled and everything like that. The plans of mice and men. Oh, God knows. God understands. And nothing surprises God. He is the sovereign. He is omnipotent. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Oh, beloved, we have a God who's sovereign. In verse 14, there's nothing we can do that God does not know and will not judge. In verse 15, we see the omniscience of God, the eternal all-knowing God. The Bible says in verse 15, that which is has already been and what is to be has already been and God requires an account of what is past. God knows what's going to happen 20 years from now. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> I have no clue what's going to happen this afternoon and neither do you. But oh, beloved, God knows. God knows the steps we take. God knows the directions we go. 
God knows the heart and the minds of all men. And the Bible says that he is the eternal all-knowing God. First Samuel 2, 3 says, Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. All things are judged, beloved. God will hold mankind accountable, not only for their thoughts, not only for their actions, but for their, their, their rebellion against him. Oh, beloved, there is an omniscient God who knows all things. We see not only a perfect world, but we see a perfect Lord. In verse 16 and 17, we see life's sinful presence. Oh, what life could have been like in the garden. Can you ever imagine what would happen if Adam and Eve hadn't ate that fruit? Did you ever think what would have imagined what our life would have been like? Oh, beloved, we would have been here. We would have been living in a perfect world in a perfect situation. Oh, think about it, beloved. You'd have had a perfect friend, a perfect maid, a perfect uh, pastor. You'd have had a perfect everybody. But what we see here, folks, is the requirement of judgment's necessity. There is a necessity for judgment of God. In verse 16, the Bible says, Moreover, I saw under the sun in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. We see the demonstration of sin's presence. Oh, beloved, everywhere we go, sin is present. Do you ever think about gravity? I mean, do you ever just think and say, why am I sitting in this chair? When you walk out to your car, do you think, why am I even walking on the ground? Do you know that the earth is circling? You ever thought about that? Why, you know, you remember those little merry-go-rounds in the, in the school playground? Everybody would pull it and all of a sudden, man, boom, people would fly off. What in the world? What in the world? Why aren't we holding on to trees? Why aren't we holding on? Why aren't we seat belt buckled to, to the ground, to the floor? You know, what's going on here? God has a purpose for everything, beloved. The Bible says there is sin in the presence of this old world. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How did sin come about? Sin came about by people, Adam and Eve. The Bible didn't say that the animals sinned. The Bible didn't say that the, the tiger ate the fruit or the elephant ate the fruit or the giraffe ate the fruit. The Bible says Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And because of their sin, it permeated all of the world. We see the demonstration of sin's presence. Also, we see the demand of sin's punishment. In verse 16, the Bible says in place of judgment, the Bible says wickedness was there. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. O oh, beloved, each and every one of us, believers or non-believers, after we die, after we close our eyes in mortal slumber, after we give up the ghost, so to speak, we will stand before God and give an account of our lives. In verse 17, we see the reality of judgment's need. Solomon understands that judgment is coming. Solomon understands the need of judgment is because of sin. Look at verse 17. I said in my heart, within the inward being, he didn't mean that blood pumping muscle. What he meant was in his own personal being. The Bible says in verse 17, the comprehension of the nature of judgment. I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. We see the Bible declares that God's judgment is sure. The believer will be judged. You and I as believers in Christ will stand before Jesus one day. I don't fear that judgment. I know that God's judgment is true. And God's judgment is real. And I will be judged as you will be judged for all things we have said and done for him. Now our sins, beloved, have been judged on Calvary. That's been taken care of. That's been settled out of court. But you and I are going to stand before the Lord one day and all our works are going to be judged by God. The Bible says that fire is going to come down upon our, our works. 
Our works are described by two ways. Number one, it says it's either precious stones or, or precious metals, gold or silver or precious stones. The bad works that we do or the things that we don't do for God are considered hay, stubble, and, and uh, different little things like that can burn up. And so when the fire comes down, if our whatever works is left, we're going to be given a reward for. The Bible does say that there are those who will have no reward, that that fire will burn up everything they've ever thought they have done for Christ. And therefore, the Bible says, and they will suffer loss. That's in heaven, folks. That's not in hell. We're not talking about sending Christians to hell. That is in heaven, and they will suffer loss, but they will be saved, the Bible says. That gives me some assurance that those people who are living on the margin will be going to heaven. They just won't be rewarded. So we see, beloved, there's a judgment of believers. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Not according to sins, folks, but our works. And then we see also in Revelation chapter 20, the non-believer at the great white throne judgment, they're going to go before God and be judged also. In Revelation 20, 15, it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. They're going to be judged according to sin. So there is a reality of judgment, a com comprehensive nature of judgment. All people are going to be judged. Can't escape it. God is there. God knows. And then we see that the deniers, the doubters, and those de delayers are going to be judged by God. They're going to be doubting God. They're going to be, they're going to be uh, denying God. They're going to be delaying their, their time to receive Christ, and they're going to be caught there in judgment. Then we see the conclusive nature of judgment in verse 17. For there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. The Bible says everything is going to be judged. Everything that is not covered by the blood of Jesus. Judgment is coming for all. The good, the bad, and yes, the ugly. Every work will be judged whether it's good or bad. 1 John 4, 17 says love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world so live today for Jesus live today for the world yet to come don't give up don't give in to all these crazy things and all these crazy ideas and all these emotions of anger and, and fear and all these matters that control the lives of people. Live for God. Live for God. Now we see that Solomon looks at, at the afterlife. In verses 18 through 21, we see, first of all, a common nature of death. Death is going to be common for all people. Look at verse 18. And I, I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them that they may see that they themselves are like animals. <laughs> Solomon begins to, be, begin, begins to become very pessimistic. Beloved, I don't think God sees us like he sees the animals. I think God made us in his image. He didn't make the giraffe in his image, didn't make the elephant in his image, didn't make the chimpanzee, I'm sorry, uh, Darwin, in his image. Death is life's concerning dilemma. It's something there that's in the back of our mind that we go along and all, every once in a while it comes to our mind. You might be passing by a car accident. You might be passing by a hospital. You might be passing by a hospice. Or you might be passing by something else and suddenly that matter of death comes to mind. You see, death is life's concerning dilemma. Death is the unwelcome guest at any gathering or get-together. Everyone thinks of death, but not everyone prepares for it. And so what Solomon is saying here is simple. He doesn't get it. Life is different for a human being than for an animal. An animal doesn't prepare for the afterlife. We should do that. And therefore, if we do not do that, are we not like the animals? How many times have you asked your kids, why are you acting like a monkey? <laughs> why are you acting like this and doing that, you know? 
How, maybe it's because we're not listening to God. We see death is life's concerning dilemma. Death is life's common destiny. Death comes to all living things. We must be prepared for its coming. Death is a reality. It's no respecter of persons. The, young, the first funeral I ever had in my ministry by myself was that of a stillborn baby. My very first one. My father-in-law's first funeral in his ministry was a little two or three-year-old who was run over by his, their mother in their driveway. Life is not a respecter of persons. The oldest person I've ever buried was 102 years old. Oh, beloved, think about it. Life is not a respecter. We have no guarantees. Death is life's common destiny. Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Folks, I go to bed every night thanking God for the day that he'd given me. I go to bed every night praying for my family, praying for our protection. I go to bed every night thanking the Lord for what he has done for me. And when I wake up in the morning, I start all over again. My feet touch the floor. I thank God for the day that he has given me. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Oh, beloved, think about it. There is no rhinoceros that's praying right now. I thank you for this day you've given me, folks. We are different than the animals. In verse 19, we see the cursed nature of death. The Bible says, for what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them as one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals for all is vanity. Oh, Solomon, you're missing life. You've become so, so old and tired and insignificant in the world that you have suddenly put man and animals together as one. Oh, folks, be careful. Listen, we can become so bad like Solomon and become so pessimistic in our life, so pessimistic in our outlook that we fail to see the glory that's waiting for us. We fail to see the love that God has provided. We fail to see that, yes, death is coming, but so is life. Oh, beloved, cursed nature of death, the desolation of the fall. When Adam and Eve sinned, everything paid the price. The universe was changed. Animals were changed. Everything was changed on that day that they ate the fruit and disobeyed God. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Oh, beloved, the animals die, the trees die, the planets die, the stars die, Everything in the universe has been, has been tainted by them, the uh, a plague of sin. That's why these people who are seeking to find the, the evidence of the beginning of the universe, the origin of the universe, they'll never find it. Not in this world, not in the universe, not on Mars. Why? Because they're looking at a crime scene, a tainted crime scene. Sin changed everything, beloved. Solomon does not see that, that man has been elevated still, even in sin. God's given them grace and glory, but he sees them as an animal. We see the determination of fate in verse 19. Everyone dies. It is there at the conclusion of our life. When do we die, preacher? When your life is over. When is life over? I have no clue. If I knew that, beloved, you and I could put up a stand outside and, and we could make money on this, right? But beloved, that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> that's way above what I'm capable of doing. I'm in this old world with you. I'm walking the path, going in the canoe, going down the river just as you are. We see that there's a cursed nature of death. In verse 20 and 21, we finally see Solomon's pessimistic view of the earthly. 
Oh, Solomon, why have you changed? Your life has become pessimistic. Why is it old people become mean and grouchy and ugly in the latter parts of their days? Have you seen people like this? I'm telling you, I've been called all kinds of names and been called all manner of things, not necessarily by a lot of young people either. <laughs> in verse 20, by the way, old, mean, ugly people were old, were young, mean, ugly people too. They don't change, beloved. If you want to live for Jesus, live for Jesus now. When you get to be an old person, you'll be a person who loves Jesus and live for him too. We see the result of sin. And what is that? Death. Look at verse 20. All go to one place. All are from the dust and are returned to dust. Well, that's the pronouncement of God. Genesis 2.17, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. God told Adam, I brought you from the dust, and you'll return to dust. Oh, beloved, many years ago, I found a little squirrel in our backyard. He, was, he wasn't moving. I caught him very easily. <laughs> he had died. And so what did I do? Well, I could have thrown him in the trash. I could have just thrown him in the garbage. But there was something in my heart that literally changed. And so I dug a little hole in the back and, and put him in there and closed it up. Now, I didn't give a, <laughs> didn't give a, a Bible study or anything like that. But I thought, you know, this poor little creature of God has died. And the Bible says, from dust you were taken and dust you will return. Now, beloved, think about that. We have that in common with the animals. But we see Solomon's pessimistic view of the result of sin, which is death, yes. But the reality of sin is the grave. Psalm 49, 15 says, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave or Sheol for he shall receive me, Selah. I love the way John Phillips talks about that word, Selah. He says that's a notation, an explanation point by the psalmist who says, there, what do you think of that? <laughs> the Bible says he has redeemed us from the power of the grave. Our old body is going to go to the grave, folks, unless Jesus comes back. But beloved, our soul will be present with the Lord. The Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we see the reality of sin, which is the grave. There'll be no more cemeteries in the new heaven and the new earth, beloved. There'll be no, no mortuaries. There'll be no funeral homes. There'll be no hospitals in the new heaven and the new earth because there will be no sin. In verse 21, we see Solomon's pessimistic view of the eternal. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men which go upward or the, and the spirit of animal which goes down to the earth? He has a doubtful comprehension. He does not gather the truth. What happens to the soul of men? Do they just go down into the dirt? Do we sleep in the grave? Do we go down in this place called Sheol or paradise? By the way, beloved, that's what happened to the souls of men and women who were believers in, in before the resurrection of Christ. They went to a place called Sheol, the grave. Now, again, it's a different title that we have. When we think of the grave, we think of the hole in the ground. But in the biblical sense, in the Hebrew sense, it was a place where the souls of the believers and those who loved God went to. Jesus went to Sheol and preached to the captives, the Bible says. For three days he was there, rose from the dead, and when he rose from the dead, he took those captives with him. That's why in the book of, of Psalm chapter 24, the Bible says, as they were going to heaven there, the Bible says the angel shouted from the top of the, of the gate, who is this king of glory? Jesus says, let me in. I'm the king of glory. He says, who is this king of glory? He says, the Lord, mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. And speaking of his cross there, he fought the battle for us, beloved. He overcame death. He overcame the devil. And beloved, we have the freedom to go with the king of glory. And then there will be a second time as he stands before the great uh, great uh, uh, gates of heaven and the angel will call out again who is this king of glory and Jesus will say the Lord the mighty 
the great host comes the king of glory. And oh, beloved, that's when you and I are going to be with him to be there in the glory. We see where our bodies are going to be put in the grave. Our souls are going to be with him in heaven. But one day the resurrection happens and all the bodies of those who have lived for Christ are going to be raised from the dead. In verse 21, we see a doubtful comprehension. We see his rational thinking that no one can comprehend what faith believes in. How can anybody know what God is going to do? How can anybody know, Solomon says, the truth of God? Oh, beloved, we know because he told us so. I go, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you into myself that where I am, there you may be also. Oh, beloved, think about it. We know where we're going. We know where we're going. Oh, folks, do you believe in London, England? Have you been there before? You may not have been there, but yet you believe. You've been to Beijing, China. You may have been there before, but you may be not, and you still believe it exists. Why can we not believe that there is a celestial city? None of us in this room have been there, but lo and behold, it's there. The Bible says it is. We see his doubtful comprehension in his dismal conclusion in verse 21. And the spirit of the animal which goes down to the earth. Beloved, hold fast to God's word. For the psalmist answers Solomon's dilemma. Turn a little bit to your left to Psalm chapter 49. Psalm chapter 49. The psalmist answers Solomon's question. The psalmist answers Solomon's dilemma. In Psalm chapter 49, look at verse 13. This is the way of those who are foolish and of their prosperity who approve or posterity who approve these say in Selah. Like sheep they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them, the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. Oh, I like this, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah, there, what do you think of that? Oh, beloved, the grave is, is Sheol, the place where the departed spirits went. It's empty today. Jesus went down there. He preached to the souls. He took them to heaven. We're going to be with Jesus one day. Finally, in verse 22, Solomon says three times in this chapter, three times Solomon looks back to the Garden of Eden. The Bible says in verse 22, so I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage, for who can bring him to see what will happen after this? What he's talking about again is about work, that our work should be given to God. Our work should be like the work there in the Garden of Eden. Solomon looks back to the Garden of Eden, but the answer is not to look back to the Garden, but the answer is to look forward to the cross. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus came, beloved, to repair the breach between God and man. Oh, he closed death's door for us. He closed that old place called Sheol. He closed that place called paradise, that place called Abraham's bosom that we might be there with him to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And where is Jesus today in heaven? Oh, beloved, think about it. Solomon had a pessimistic look of the end of life. Oh, beloved, I'm not ready to leave yet. I've got my ticket. I'm ready to go anytime. I'm just not ready to get on the train yet. I'm not ready to go. It's too many things I've got to do. Too many things I've got to say. Too many things I've got to engage in. But oh, beloved, think about it. One day, one day, we can have that wonderful, wonderful assurance that God is with us. 
that we are not alone, that when death comes, as Moody said, they're going to say in the newspaper, when I die, oh, D.L. Moody has died. He said, don't you believe a word of it. I'm more, I'll am more. i be more alive than ever before. And beloved, that is the truth. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day you've given us, for the opportunity to be here in the house of God, for the opportunity, Father, to sing the praises of your Son, to bring honor and glory to Jesus, to bring our prayers to you, Father, and lay them upon the steps of heaven. And, oh, Father God, we have opened your word and spoken your truth. And, Father, there are those who've listened and those who've incorporated and those who have placed it in the memories of their lives that they might remember the days yet ahead. And, oh, Father God, be with us as we come to this time of decision. There are those who need to make a decision for the Lord, perhaps in their own salvation. Those who are watching on YouTube or Facebook or those are even here today. And Father God, if there be someone today without Jesus, they don't have that assurance of eternal life. They don't have that assurance of life after death. Oh, Father God, give them this opportunity. Help them to understand that we're all sinners. We were born that way. That we have come into this world as sinners. And Father God, Jesus came as our Savior. That he is the son of God and he died for each and every one of our sins. And Father, if we would just believe in him, invite him into our heart, we could have eternal life. Let them pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I know I have fallen short of your glory. I confess my sins. I repent of my sins and ask that you give me life eternal. I believe, Jesus that you rose from the dead, that you paid the penalty for all my sins. And I believe, Jesus, that you came to give me life everlasting, so I invite you now to come into my heart and to save my soul. And for the rest of my life, Lord, I'll live for you. I thank you, Jesus, for my salvation. Lord, I continue in prayer and ask that you bless those who prayed that prayer just now. And that you'd give them strength, Father, to live their life daily for Jesus. That they might make a profession of their faith to a family member or a friend or even come to a church service and be baptized and make a public profession of their salvation and their Savior. Whatever decision you've placed on the hearts of men and women today, Lord God, let it be done today. Let those, Father God, hearts be opened to your will. And be willing, Father, to follow your word. And be with us if anybody has any decision to come forward and pray. Let them, Father, come, for this is a house of prayer. Whatever decision is made, let it be made in your honor and glory. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road we're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Let's be